Come on, let's be honest. The whole time we were Protestants, a church is judged by its numbers and its building programs. Why? Because infrastructure speaks to what? Authority. And to tell you, and to give you an idea of how pervasive this is, and I, I, mean, I mean, I'm beyond this now, but I know this is the very same thing that, that there are, that people who come to this ministry are struggling with this very idea themselves because we call it a paradigm. Mm -hmm. Okay? When someone tells you to think outside the box, mm -hmm. that box is your paradigm. It's the set, right. of, it's the set of rules by which we function. Mm -hmm. and, and, we tend to, and we tend to operate within those rules. We get stuck in those rules. Right. So we're operating according to this paradigm. And, you know, look, I've been, we've been, I, I started having these issues back in, from back in 2010. You and couldn't back, put your finger on it, but two, you knew. Right, but, and back in 2010, even as far back as 2010, when I saw the the, issue, the problems with doctrine coming into coming into our church, I was like, I was perfectly willing to start my own church. But you know what held me back? I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified to do that. Right. I've got to go to seminary. I've got to learn. I've got to do all the training. I've got to have this, and I've got to have that. I was like, or if I'm going to start another church, I've got to find a pastor who will be willing to come in and lead this right. and take this over. But here's the thing. I was willing to come out and start something new. Mm -hmm. It took me about three years before I finally realized, before I kind of finally came to the realization, that's wrong thinking. Before I finally came to the realization that that's not the way it was ever supposed to be. And here right. I am, I'm a slave to this paradigm that I've been so conditioned to accept as this is the way it has to be. Right. Now, obviously, I look back on that now and I can't understand why I ever thought that way. But I have to go back and get into that mindset and understand that the majority of the people that come to this ministry to, to, to tank to Paul's passing thoughts and whatnot are, right. are stuck in this same mindset, and they right. can't get past that. And that's why we have a lot of people, hundreds actually, watching our ministry, mm -hmm. but they're not willing, they're not ready to take that big step of actually being associated with us. That's, that's a big step, and I thoroughly understand. You know, people say, well, you know, this, that, and the other. I go, it's all right. I understand. I, I, a very close friend of mine, and you, know, and you probably know who I'm talking about. Uh -huh. um, you know, he keeps saying to me, you know, he's like, how can you do that? You know, what, what, I can't do that. What if I, here's the thing, what if I mess it up? I'm not I don't mm -hmm. feel I don't feel qualified enough in understanding the Bible. I don't feel I understand enough about the Bible to do what you're doing. What if I mess it up? What if I get it wrong? And so there's the other thing that kind of holds people back is this whole idea of qualification. Well, why do people feel unqualified? People who have sat in church People who, listen, people who have sat in church all their lives don't feel qualified to teach the Bible. What's wrong with that? Because there's a dichotomy of, of uh, knowledge. They have, been purposely, good and evil. they have been purposely kept ignorant. That's right. That's not how it's supposed to be. Now, full stop. Full stop on a couple issues. Totally full stop. Two issues. I get mad. Oh, now go tonight when, when you go to bed tonight and you're laying in bed okay now with with hearing what you just said read the book of first corinthians especially the first three chapters 
with those eyes. This is exactly the issue that was going on with the Corinthians that Paul writes about that was causing all of the problems in that church. This whole authority issue. And Paul said, look among you. Not many wise, not many nobles. And guess what? He said, he calls it their calling. Look among those who who are called. Look at your calling. You know, calling is a big thing that Protestantism has hijacked. The term calling in the Bible. Right. But read the first three or four chapters of 1 Corinthians and here's what you learn. The Al Mollers, the John Pipers, the John MacArthur's, they're not called. They're not called. They're not called out to the assembly of Christ. Sure, they're welcome if you want to contribute something. Uh, if you want to contribute your gift to the group, that's fine. But you know what? You're not called. Read it for yourself. He said, look at, look at the vast majority of people in the assembly of Christ that are called. Not many noble. Not many wise. Not many educated. The Protestant church is completely, like every other thing else in the Bible, has completely flipped that on its head. The ones who are called to control everything and run the show are these elitists who we support for doing nothing. They're a bunch... Anyway. (laughs) Don't get started. Whoa. 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 (laughs) Pull it back. Hit the brakes. Keep going with your timeline. I recall two conversations that I heard when you were speaking with somebody on the phone. Um, And you probably recall, because one was down here when your office was down here. And the other was most recently mm-hmm. we were having the uh, Q and A with the Great Britain people. Uh, first, one of the first things they asked Paul was, "What are your qualifications?" Right. And then you received an email because you challenged somebody to a debate, mm-hmm. and the answer was, "Not qualified." You are not qualified to debate me because you have not been to seminary. You have no qualifying degrees to debate me. And uh, we just sat and laughed. (laughs) This was something, and you know, studying this, I see it everywhere now. Okay? Uh, uh, National Geographic. The most influential figures of ancient history. Okay? All kings and philosophers. Every one of them. Confucius, Caesars, okay? Almost the first reigned circa 15 to blah, 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 blah. Every one of them. Reigning kings and philosophers. And the philosophers predicated, you know, uh, what the rulers the philosophy yeah, they use to rule. Okay? So, you know, we don't have that much of an influence uh, on, uh, we don't have that much of an influence on, um, you know, the, uh, the, the culture and Western culture because, you know, uh, a the Assembly of Christ is a literal family. Um, um, you know, this isn't our kingdom. So, of course, we're not going to be recognized in that regard. But my point is, is um, the whole idea of institution is antithetical to how the Assembly of Christ should function. Okay? It's two totally different things. Okay, now, where are we here? Does anybody know? Church Fathers and Bishop Elder. Okay, Church Fathers. So you've got to have to, Okay, so here's a very important date that you want to put in right here. 
with the church fathers, okay, and apostolic assembly. Somewhere in between these two, you want to put in a very, very important date. 68 A.D. 68 A.D. And why do you want to put that date in there? Why is it so important? Because that's about the time Peter and Paul, the most influential apostles, died. Okay? Um, When they died, immediately... Now, who are the church fathers? The church fathers were were, uh, really, for the most part, disciples of the apostles. Okay? Uh, who, for the most part, unfortunately, were influenced by the paganism of the day, okay, and not what the apostles taught, okay, which shouldn't surprise us too much. So, immediately after the death of the two most influential uh, apostles, Peter and Paul, uh, a debate Uh, ensued amongst the church fathers in regard to apostolic successionism. It was an authority issue. Okay? Um, And this led to the bishop-elder wars. Okay? And the bishop-elder wars, um, a lot of information about the bishop-elder wars can be drawn from the book of First Clement, okay? And uh, so, so basically, um, uh, what's going on there with the Bishop Elder war, uh, Wars? And by the way, you can get uh, two articles I wrote for the Tank Theological Journal that details all the history of this, okay? Uh, email me, whatever, I'll point you to the links or send you free copies of it. Okay, so basically, um, the church fathers, they want to uh, go to Rome because the idea of the church fathers was really, the church fathers were really all about the pagan state caste system because for the most part, they were Gnostics. Now, you have Platonism, Neoplatonism, and Gnosticism. Neoplatonism came from Platonism. uh, Gnosticism came from Neoplatonism. Okay? Gnosticism is fundamentally the the religion of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? So basically, um, you have uh, the elder... uh, um, the elder bishop wars... Okay, and basically what's going on here is um, uh, the church fathers want to put a, uh, a, make the church at Rome central headquarters for a ruling clergy, i.e. bishops. Okay, so they appoint one bishop They appoint one bishop in Rome who they think should oversee all of the home fellowships. Okay? And his name was Linus. Linus was a disciple of Peter, I believe. Okay? If I remember correctly. And actually, if you do a word search, I think Linus is even mentioned in the New Testament. I could have mine. It's been a long time since I uh, studied all of this, but um, and my memory may be failing me there. So basically, the church fathers want to appoint um, this one bishop in Rome. And why Rome? Why the church at Rome? Well, that's because that's where the Roman Empire was ruled from, and they wanted to get into this pagan state thing, okay? They wanted a church state. And so um, this, this what ensues is a power struggle between the home fellowships and the church at Rome. And this isn't tradition. This isn't fuzzy-wuzzy ideas. This is church history. 
read the ra- the readings of the church father. How do you pronounce his name? Uranus. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and read the letter um, for a first Clement from Clement of Rome. Okay, who was also a church father. Now you ask, okay, so is this the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. Now the Roman Catholic Church isn't technically the Roman Catholic Church till you get to Constantine. Okay? But what's happening is, is the bishops are contending against the elders who are leading the church, the home fellowships. Okay? And the subject of First Clement is the fact that the bishops came and started walking into home fellowships and trying to take control, and the elders said, get your heinies out of here. And uh, during that time, the home fellowships followed the elders, and they kicked these guys out. So Linus, or uh, at this point, okay, so at this point, this struggle, this power struggle is going on for, I've got the, uh, the time chart in the article. Anybody who wants those journals, let me know. I'll give you free copies. So basically, this struggle between the home fellowships and Rome, the bishops of Rome, is going on for a couple hundred years, and then you get to Clement. So Clement sends a delegation to the church at Corinth who had heeded Paul's instruction in the letters. And at this time, 150 AD, something like that, the church at Corinth is like an awesome network of home fellowships that had gone into Arcadia, and other places, and they were just renowned as far as their faith. So apparently they had heeded Paul's rebuke in First and Second Corinthians. Okay, so basically you've got this, this uh, uh, huge struggle going on, and Clement uh, starts bringing a bunch of these elders uh, up under church discipline. So basically, you've got these bishop-elder wars, okay? Now, during that time, not only are the bishop-elder wars going on, the struggle between the church at Rome and the home fellowships, very important. You also have the church-pagan state wars. Now, we still have a pagan state. But what do the church fathers want to uh, institute in Rome? They want, to, they want to institute a church state. Now, during this time, what the church in Rome can do is very limited because um, the paganism could be an institution, but at this time, the church couldn't be an institution. Okay? So you've got two wars going on at this time. The church-pagan state wars because the church fathers... And the bishops are trying to weasel in and steal the, the force and the authority of Rome away from the pagans. Now stop right there. All of the church history and glorious stories about martyrdom in the church, really it's, it's the pagans executing the, the uh, church and, you know, martyrdom, because the bishops at Rome were sticking their nose in the business of the pagan state. They were trying to, the church was trying to weasel in. In other words, it was political intrigue. It's like these, all of these Puritans like Christopher Love, who was executed, and he's a martyr. He was executed for his faith. No, he wasn't. He committed treason. Okay? Uh, most of the martyrdom of, of church history is political intrigue. Okay? The pilgrims didn't come to America for religious freedom. They were political refugees. Okay? 
They came to America to do church state better. Okay, so moving quickly along, what happens then finally, the church at Rome is wrangling and, and meddling and blah, blah, blah. Finally, they get their own way, don't they? Constantine, right? Finally, they get their own way. Now you have the church-state caste system. And Constantine is circa 4th century, right? Okay. And Constantine is where the term church right. first originates. Right. That's where we rightfully begin using the term church, which is not us. The home fellowship movement is not church. And that's a great conversation opener. You know, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, where do you go to church? We don't do church. We ain't the church. Right. Uh, Christianity is not church. And whoa, that starts some conversation. They know you're or, different then. Or where do you go to church? Right. Now. And I stay at home. Now. Okay. So, right here and there, I want you to pencil something else in. The church then, the church then, the church then begins persecuting the pagans. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I refer you to a book somebody anonymously sent me that is a wonderful thing. Okay. The Principles of the Westminster Confession of Faith Standards Persecuting. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> That's an incredible book. It's an absolutely incredible book. About, the church. about Protestantism yeah. doing exactly yeah. what the Catholics did to them. It's a, hand, it's a, it's a handbook teaching, people, teaching the church how to persecute them. Right. Now, now, here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing. Our kingdom is not of this world. Protestantism is, and they admit it. That's why they're all up in these wars and fighting for control. Okay, so now you have the church, the new church state, getting revenge on the pagan state. Okay, this is a reversal right here. This is very, Constantine is very important. Because the pagan state goes bye-bye and is replaced with the church state, i.e. Catholicism, the universal church. It's church state, okay? Which, by the way, should be better titled pagan Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still the church, but yes. Um, this is the book you read, Get Pagan Christianity by Frank Viola. Okay? Now, the church is primarily nom nomenclature, but yes, they adopted, they ad ad uh, 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 help me, adopted most of the pagan stuff into the, the church. And that's why Catholicism has so much ancient paganism in it. Okay? So the political party church state won out the day. Okay? So now, going forward, okay, you've got um, Constantine, okay, now, Augustine. Augustine is the beginning of Catholicism and Protestantism, okay? He's both, and both of them claim both, okay, or vice versa. Okay, I'm trying to hurry now, okay? Uh, Constantine was a pagan. Constantine not Constantine, Augustine, was part of the pagan state caste system. Augustine was a pagan. He was a Neoplatonist pagan, and the group he belonged to were the Manichaeans. Or, uh, close enough, Manichaeans. Manichaeans. Okay, now, when the church states take, takes over, and they began persecuting the pagans, Augustine switches over. Augustine is a turncoat. The only reason Augustine becomes part of the church and converts to the church from paganism is because of the persecution. 
in my book, in my studies. Now, I know that there were other reasons, but the timing isn't coincidental. I know that, but John Piper just really encourages everybody to read Augustine's Confessions, mm -hmm. which is kind of autobiographical in regard to his conversion. Right. And, um, et cetera. Uh, but, but, but he did switch from paganism to, uh, to the church. Now, listen to what John Piper said. This is a paraphrase. We meant to get the citation and put it up on the screen. He said, as Protestants, we should strive to make every branch of our Protestantism ooze with the tree of Augustine. Okay? But yet, the same John Piper will tell you that the Catholic Church is of the devil. Um, hello, Augustine is the doctor of grace of the Catholic Church. Okay? So, so uh, and Protestants admit this. Augustine is the foundation of the Protestant Reformation. But yet, he's essentially Catholic. Okay, now, Augustine was a, a uh, Platonist, right? Yes. Through and through. Now, this is very important. I know you're tired, but stick with me. Um, you're doing great because we're going to go through the rest quickly, okay? Thomas Aquinas. 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 Thomas Aquinas, 12th, 13th century, 12-something. I'm going to say 13th century, okay? He brings Aristotelism. Uh, he then, uh, up until this time, uh, so-called Christianity, church-state, caste system, is the integration of Platonism with, with the Bible. Now, what Thoma, Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas brings in is the integration of uh, Aristotle and the Bible. Okay? And a guy comes along that's cut from the cloth of Augustine and... This whole idea that man can know reality and the Catholic Church is being corrupted by this, what we call uh, Thomism, okay, what we call Thomism, okay. Martin Luther says, no, I will have none of it. But this Thomas Aquinas is well before Martin Luther, and by this time, the Catholic Church has all been taken over by Thomism. And this is when Martin Luther stands up and says no, and writes his 97 thesis against the use of reason in theology. See, the argument is Plato versus Aristotle. Uh, Martin Luther in defense of Augustine against Thomism. That's what the Protestant Reformation is all about, in a nutshell, all the sola scriptola, you know, it was about the script, blah, 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 nonsense. Read the 97, Paul, you mean the 95 thesis? No, 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 no. A whole year before that was Luther's 97 theses against the use of reason, okay, or against Thomism. That's the whole deal with the Protestant Reformation, okay? Then you have John Calvin coming along and putting feet on Martin Luther's uh, uh, cause, okay? The uh, uh, Calvin Institutes, 1111, that's book one, chapter one, um, section, one. section one, sentence one, it should be four ones there. Here's what John Calvin says, and I paraphrase. He says, All wisdom, as far as its wisdom, is, I'm paraphrasing, 
is found in the knowledge of God and man. And you say, okay. Well, what did Calvin think of man? That man is totally depraved. So what is that? It's the same old knowledge of good and evil. He said all wisdom is encapsulated in the knowledge of, of God and man. Well, that's the same thing as the knowledge of good and evil. Right back to the garden. All of the Calvin Institutes is predicated on the religion, the serpent's religion of the garden. Okay? Uh, and if you also look at it, because he relied so heavily on Augustine, and mm -hmm. Augustine built his right. church doctrines on Platonism, God and man is the same dualism that Plato had. Right. The invisible and the visible, the, the visible being totally depraved or, or matter being bad. Right. And the invisible being spiritual and good. So. So, so moving quickly along here, and I thank you for sticking with me because I really want to finish this out while my mind's plugged into it. Okay. So basically you have um, the primary uh, argument then that develops in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church adopts, listen to this, the Catholic Church adopts the idea that man is able. That man is able. Man is able to do what? Co-labor with the Catholic Church to finish your salvation. Now we believe... As a third party, we believe that you don't finish salvation. Salvation's done once and for all via the new birth and all the implications of the law to the new birth accordingly. The Catholic Church leaves its Platonism and says, no, 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 man is able. Man can know reality. But it only, the, the, the best thing about that is um, the best thing about that is the fact that it enables man to co-labor with us to finish your salvation. And by the way, the only w way you can, the only place you can do a legitimate co-laboring to finish your salvation is in the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm going to stop just for a second because I remember what my second point is. Uh, preface. Okay? When I had people come up to me in the institutional church who had doctorate degrees in you name it and say... Is this a Sunday school or is it seminary? You know, this is hard. This is too deep. Didn't anybody tell you keep the cookies on the bottom shelf? Kiss? Okay, what's going on there? What's going on there? The dichotomy between worldly knowledge and spiritual knowledge. That's what's going on. I'm like, too deep? You went to school for eight years. College. Too deep? It's the divorce of reason and spirit and scripture. Right. Divorce, a dichotomy between material knowledge. So we're at an evangelical Baptist church. And this professor from Cedarville is preaching. Susan and I are dating. Oh my goodness, it's a miracle that we got married. Okay? And we're sitting in this church and we're listening to this guy from Cedarville. And Susan's, Susan's like, doesn't this sound good? Isn't this great? And I'm, and I'm like, honey, it's in your face Gnosticism. And she's like, here we go again. Nobody's right. Everywhere we go, you know, honey, I'm sorry. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. It's in-your-face Gnosticism. And this is exactly what this guy was preaching. Well, the 
he took the book of James and twisted it to make a difference between worldly knowledge and spiritual knowledge. Where James says knowledge that comes from above versus earthly knowledge, he took that and put a Gnostic spin on it, a Platonist spin on it. And that's what the sermon was. And on the surface, it sounded good. And Susan's like, hey, you know, this is great. Maybe we can join here. Blah, blah, blah. And I go, honey, it's in your face Gnosticism. Okay? And on it, she was not happy. So after the Protestant Reformation, which was, um, you know, and the Protest the war between Protestant and Catholics is still going on to this day. Okay, uh, so you have John Get Now, look at this, the historical grammatical interpretation. You see that? Okay, that, uh, that came about through confused Protestants of the Protestant Reformation. Tyndale... Uh, who was the other guy that printed the Bible and made the Bible accessible? Who? Did, t- let's say... Uh, Wycliffe? No. Wycliffe, yeah. Let, let's do Wycliffe. Let's do Tyndale. Okay. They had this great idea to make the Bible available to all people. Okay, now, the Protestant Reformation... Uh, believed the Bible had one use, right? It's a gospel meta narrative to show you your what? Total depravity and continually lead you back to the cross. That's the only purpose of the Bible. Okay? All right. That's the only purpose of the Bible. Well, how do we naturally, what's our natural inclination, especially uneducated people, how would they read the Bible? Grammatically, right? So basically because of that, because you had this confusion about what the Protestant Reformation was, was really about, and well-meaning Protestants made the Bible available to the masses, and I guarantee you John Calvin was in, was in the inner chambers just screaming and pulling his hair out, okay? Um, so basically what happens then, because the Bible is made so available to people in the Protestant Reformation, you have uh, what we call confused Protestantism, okay? Okay. Um, the, the actual interpretation of the Bible and reality of the Protestant Reformation is the, re, the historical redemptive interpretation of reality. All reality is to be interpreted through the cross. Heidelberg Disputation. We did a whole series on that. And, and put feet on how all, according to the Protestant Reformation, all reality is to be interpreted through the suffering of the cross in redemption. Okay? Um, it's not a book of knowledge to teach you how to live, man, because man can't do anything good anyway. Right? Remember the citation from the Calvin Institutes that I cited? Okay, so you get this confused Protestantism. Okay? Meanwhile... You have um, the Puritan church state, and they're in a quibbling with the Church of England, I believe it was, and executing each other and killing each other. And there was the, uh, the uh, Thirty Year War and all that kind of stuff. War, war, war. Europe was in total blood flowing up to the horses' bridles, so to speak. Uh, because of uh, the Protestant Reformation and the fact that uh, they persecuted, they now uh, adopted the same philosophy as the, um, the Catholics did as far as murdering people that they disagreed with. Why? All the way back to the garden and, and caste and uh, uh, Genesis 4-7, and what immediately came out of Genesis 4-7? Murder! 
what happens right after Genesis 4-7? Cain murders Abel. What's going on down here in the Protestant Catholic Wars? And, uh, and by the way, some groups that were, uh, were, could be considered part of a home fellowship movement that poo-pooed the whole thing like the Anabaptists, they had both the Protestants and Catholics against them. Okay? Why? Why all of the murdering and bloodshed? Back here. All the way back here. Okay? Moving on quickly. All right. So, you've got confused Protestantism. Then you've got the Puritan church state. And they say, we can do church state better. We're going to the new land, America. So they do. Okay? So the Puritans come to America and they chart a, stir a church state. Okay? And as the population grows in America, listen, colonial America was a church state. Colonial America was a church state. It was a European church state. Now, who enforced who enforced the orthodoxy of the Puritans? The British. The British. Okay? It was a, a Puritan British church state. Okay? Um, now, Congregationalism. Con I want to throw Congregationalism in there. Okay? I want to throw Congregationalism in there. And if you go back and look at colonial history, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if, if you were, it was the death penalty if you were of a certain class of individual and were caught dressing as somebody of an upper class, it was the death penalty. All kinds of stuff like that. Okay, the Puritans were the starters of the public school system uh, to where children of the Puritans were boarded because the state, the Puritan state, church state, didn't want children being too close to their parents. On and on and on and on and on. Okay, it was a church state. America wasn't founded by Puritanism and Christianity. Hogwash. Okay? Um, so, congregationalism, why do I want to put them in there? Okay, moving quickly along. Why do I want to put them in there? Because they were, this, uh, they're indicative of the confusion that, that, that you get. Congregationalists held on to the same progressive justification of the Puritans but they changed their church government to like a democratic government. But due to the fact that they held on to the same progressive justification, eventually congregationalism ends up being tyranny again. Why? In fact, I think Jonathan Edwards helped them develop the Savoy Declaration. Okay? You had a fox right in the hen house you know, helping the hens write their, their uh, statement of faith, okay? So that's the kind of confusion that goes on. Let's move on. All right, so after the American Revolution, era, uh, after the American Resolution, listen to me, after the American Revolution, the church state is put to an end worldwide. Worldwide. Communism fills the void. Communism fills the void. Communism doesn't come along in world history out of nowhere. It happened for a reason. Because a void was left in the church-state idea. Communism was just a replacement of the church-state in, in secular form. It was a secular replacement of, uh, and it's really, they call it secular, but, you know, same ideas as the old pagan state, ancient pagan state cast. Okay, so what do we have after that? We have the Australian Forum comes along, and at this time you have confused Protestantism that's kind of halfway, uh, kind of half-pregnant ability of man. 
half pregnant or belly a man. Okay, then you have the um, a new uh, Australian forum comes along. Okay, now listen, put a very important date there, the Australian forum. Okay, 1970. Okay, 1970. Listen, this is crazy. This is crazy. These two movements happen at the same time. The Australian Forum comes to confuse Protestantism. A Seventh-day Adventist by the name of Robert Brinsmead. And he says, you blokes, he's from Australia, you blokes don't have a clue what a Protestant is. And he was invited to Westminster Seminary to have a sit-down with all the big Protestant guys of that day. Okay? To the, to much to the chagrin of J. Adams. J. Adams was at Westminster at the time and had conniption fits and, and refused to attend the meeting. Okay? But I don't know who all was at that meeting, but I think Dr. Jack... Uh, John Jack Miller was there. I think M Dr. Michael Horton was probably there. I think he probably flew out from California to attend the meeting. Pallison wouldn't have been there. Okay, I doubt he was there. Okay, but uh, what's his name? Cloney or whatever that guy's name was that was president of Westminster at the time. He was definitely there and was, was uh, affected and turned. But yeah, he's, um, he is, uh, uh, so, at the same time you have uh, Jay Adams's introduction of competent to counsel, and I contend that this was the only true revival that Protestantism has ever seen. Why? Because Adams had this half-baked idea that Christians could actually do something in their, in their walk with God. The, it all boiled down to, we can actually do something in our walk with God? Now, how's that possible 2,000 years later? How can that possibly happen? Well... Because Christianity was fundamentally based on Platonism. Okay? So, um, the Australian Forum there, uh, which uh, unconfuses Protestantism, and out of that you have the New Calvinism movement. Okay? And you can draw a line from New Calvinism back to... Martin Luther and John Calvin, if you like. You can draw you can draw a circle, you know, around John Calvin and Martin Luther, and then you can draw an arrow to the new Calvinist movement, and then from that circle that you draw around them, you can draw a line back to Augustine. Okay? Now, where do we go from there? Here's what I think will happen. Due to the fact that New Calvinism is taking the church back to authentic Protestantism, I believe that, uh, that uh, uh, Protestantism will die a social death and you will see a reemergence of home, the home fellowship movement. And now what you can do, you can draw a line from the home fellowship movement back to apostolic assembly. I believe that's going to happen. Why? Because it's the truth. And people will be forced to, to face that truth because Protestantism more and more is going to die a social death because it's returning back to the tyranny of the, uh, the old. So, what's happening in the book of Revelation? It's so plain. It's so plain. Yeah, I mean, it's so in your face. Revelation is a return back to the church state with a stinking vengeance. And I predict 
that pr Protestantism and Calvin, uh, Catholicism will reunite. And uh, what you have is this viral, steroidal church state in the book of Revelation. Okay? Americanism tempers church state. Americanism and its idea of the freedom of man and the ability of man. Okay? Now, John MacArthur Jr. preached a sermon not that long ago entitled uh, how the, uh, or it, the theme was that, that the Protestant Reformation was all about the inability of man. He used those terms. But here's what John MacArthur does in that sermon. He actually states that the inability of man was a unique idea with the Protestant reformers. And you've got like 5,000 pastors out there listening to this going, Amen, Amen. How ignorant can you get? The inability of man has saturated civilization since the garden. And you got this... And do you understand now what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell the Corinthians and what James was trying to tell the people that, uh, uh, that he was writing to? Why are you listening to these imbeciles? They're not even in touch with reality. The inability of man is, is a historical anomaly unique with the Protestant reformers. Laugh out loud. The inability of man has saturated human existence since the garden. And he's actually up there saying this, and all of these people that we pay all this big money to and say are the experts are out there bobbleheading it. Okay? It's ridiculous. Okay? Uh, so that's what's going on in Revelation, and I think prior to the book of Revelation and what happens there, you will see the reuniting of Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism. Why? Because just like Protestantism uh, has been half-pregnant Protestantism for the past 200 years, Protestantism is also half-pregnant Catholicism. And why has New Calvinism, the authentic article of the Protestant Reformation gospel, why has it taken the church by storm? Because the Protestant church was already primed for it. It was already half-pregnant with Platonism. New, so New Calvinism comes in, and of course they're taking over the church like a wildfire. It's already primed for it. And let me tell you something. Protestantism is already primed to be Catholic again. It's, it's, now listen, so what's the new Calvinist doing? It's taking the church back to its Platonist roots. Okay? So will new Calvinism take Catholicism back to its Platonist roots before Thomism? I think it will. I think these two groups are going to find a way to come together, okay? And it's going to increase, um, uh, what, Catholics or two billion now? Something like that, okay? They'll even have, um, listen, this back here, this argument back here, Plato will win out again, and that's what's going to unite all of these faiths together in a steroidal church state slash pagan state that has never been seen in human history nor ever will be seen and persecution following. Overseen by the Antichrist. Overseen by the Antichrist. That's Revelation. Now let me close with what new heaven and new earth is. New heaven and new earth. I told you to draw a line back to that. Let's finish with the gospel. Back to the tabernacle. What was the tabernacle and the witness all about? Or in the wilderness all about? What was it all about? It was about God tabernacling with man. There isn't this big, huge dichotomy between God and man. 
okay? God walked in the garden with man, okay? And what God ultimately wants to do is tabernacle with man. And what we have after the true kingdom that is presently in heaven comes back and takes the earth by force, and see, up until then, it's body, it's gift, it's nothing to do with authority. Jesus said while he was doing his ministry, hey, if it's about authority, could I not call a legion of angels right now and just take the whole thing over like that? It's not about authority, okay? It's about persuasion. It's, it's, uh, so basically, what do we got going on with the new heaven and new earth? And this is the gospel. This is the gospel. God vacates his, his home in heaven and comes down to live with man. New heaven and new earth. <clears throat> heaven is vacated. The bride is new Jerusalem on earth. Okay? God leaves his home in heaven and comes down in tabernacles with man. Okay. The city that Abraham looked for. Not, right. Not built with hands. Right. Abraham looked, Hebrews, Abraham looked for a city built by God. Okay. That's, that's the God we seek. The God that abandons his home in heaven and comes down to live with man. Okay. He's not some God in heaven that pre-selects who's going to be saved and not going to be saved to his glory. This is a, this is a humble God, okay, that, that came to save the world, who leaves his home in heaven and comes down to tabernacle with man. It's pictured in the tabernacle in the wilderness.